All right. So today's episode, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start start by discussing um, the best top ten Scott moments in X Men. So ten ish. We couldn't we couldn't really finalize the list, so we got a couple. <laughs> we have a couple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, honestly, how can you? I so, was um, say, how'd you narrow it down to ten? That must have been very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, just kidding. we we tried our best. I tried to when we were. I, I try to think of Scott. The the last episode we had with you, I try to think of not repeating other things on that that we discuss. And I, I'm fairly confident that these are these are moments or or touchstones from your time on the X books that we haven't discussed fully on the podcast. And mm. David gets to kick us off with our first one. All right. So my absolute favorite issue of all time, which I, I wish I would have. Can we can we cut for a second so I could have it here because yeah, I have yeah, it. I, I have it autographed. So hold on. I wonder which one it is. Do you know Paul? I know, I know which one it is, but we're gonna let you be surprised on it. I want to. I I would go upstairs right now and pick my um, astonishing X Men four that you signed for me at WonderCon, but I have that safely tucked away. And if I unearth it, and we're doing, cons- you can't see it, but we're doing some renovations here. I know it's gonna, someone's gonna come in and drop something on it, and I'll be very angry about it. Well, I'll always sign a new one if it, if they oh. do. That's kind. Okay, All right. so um, the very first best top ten Scott moment for me, all right, is Uncanny X Men. You ready? Drum roll. Mm-hmm. Three ninety one. <sighs> okay, and here it is, signed by the man. I can. Oh, right oh the, uh, the camping issue. Yeah. The camping issue. Yeah, okay, yeah. as anyone that's ever had like you know daddy issues. Uh, you, you you can relate to this book. This this story is is very um very grounded. It's it's a story about a dad and his son, and then it's it, it's about like the misgivings and the misunderstandings that they have with one another. Uh, Cyclops has the you know uh, um the understanding that his dad went up into space and had these awesome pirate adventures and he never came back for for his sons and then uh you know corsair thinks that that scott has heat beam visions but you know that's not how scott's powers work and 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 basically they, they find like a, a a mutual understanding somewhere and it's it's just a beautiful story well you know first thank you and then secondly the um you know, I used to do these, uh, they always used to call them the, uh, the after issues where there'd always be a big event. And then instead of like using that big event to, you know, the like uh, Extinction Agenda, I think is a perfect example where, yeah. and the thing is, is what most people would do at the end of a crossover is they would start a new, like they find a page in the last one to bring you into the next one and start the next storyline. And I would always be like, oh, okay, let's take a minute. And that's when you got the, you know, uh, Jubilee rollerblading with Xavier. And, you know, this was an example that came off of uh, a bigger storyline where Cyclops came dangerously close to being one of Apocalypse's guys, you know, and losing his sense of self so completely that that is really what prompted him to reach out to Corsair. And so the idea was, you know, like, it's so funny because I I could bring this up a lot, but I I probably shouldn't, but I do. But the thing is, is that, uh, you know, like when Bobby, uh, lost control over his powers to Emma, you know, yeah. there's, a, you know, whenever you have these incredibly powerful beings suddenly having their own power 
either turned against them or run, run, run wild. You know, like I always, always kept going back to those characters. Like, you know, I started the Betsy uh, Warren thing because I realized she's, they have so much in common. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, I thought it was a super, super traumatic incident for Scott. And, you know, it came after Cyclops and Phoenix where he was his own father to his own son for as long as he could be until that got yanked away from him. So I, uh, I think what's interesting is like you look at Corsair and Corsair was a, uh, you know, it, he, he was always, he was always introduced as like this pirate and he's got it all, you know, he's got this little, you know, cat lady as his uh, first mate. And, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't know anything to the Shi'ar empire. He's just, doing his pirate stuff. And when Scott says, you know, like, how, how'd you do that? How, why would you go off and, you know, just leave me and Alex? Like you knew, you know, like even when you knew you're, we were alive, you didn't come back. And I think the idea that you have this guy who's super, super carefree really probably has the most tremendous survivor's guilt in the history of the X-Men universe. I thought, well, that is really, you know, something to, explore because Scott is always, you know, Scott was always like, you don't know who I am. You never bothered to figure out who I was. You didn't, you know, come back for me and um, me and Alex. And then when uh, Corsair makes the comment about the heat beams, you know, Cyclops' reaction is like, I don't, I don't do, you know, I, these aren't fire. These aren't lasers. Like, how do you not know that dad? And, then when Corsair lays out all his feelings, all of a sudden Cyclops is like, oh, I'm doing the, I've been doing the exact same thing that I have been accusing him of. Like I've had, I wasn't interested. I never asked. I never saw the situation from his point of view. And so I, you know, like I will tell that story a thousand times. And in real life, people will say to me like, uh, you know, my, uh, my parents, my parents had to get married, and so you know because of me. No, <laughs> and like, okay, well you're you're here now, and I, they love you, and you love them, and you've had a great life. Like, why do you care what happened? You know, twenty seven years ago when your parents had sex one night, and that's kind of a crazy thing to hang your self image on. And when I was younger, I had uh, you know there's seven of us, and I used to annoy my father just for fun. He was a construction worker. And one time we were driving and I turned to him and I said, Dad, which one of us were planned and which one of us were accidents? And he said, Scott, love is never an accident. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, um, and that's how I kind of figure out. Like, I mean, that's what I that's what I loved about that issue was, you know, they didn't solve all their issues. But by the end of the issue, they were talking and you can imagine even if nobody ever went back to it. And I don't know if anybody ever did. I mean, it's been, what, 20 years, 25 years. I don't know if anybody's ever gone back to it. But if they did, you could imagine that they've had these, that 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 the con that wasn't the end of the conversation. That was the start of that conversation between them. I'm I mean, guessing. Scott was in a really interesting position. Scott, the character, not you. But Scott mm -hmm. was in an interesting position following the 12, what would lead to Morrison, Astonishing, Messiah Complex, and then Avengers versus X-Men. And we talked about this in the previous episode with you, Scott, where a lot of people talk about how Emma's journey began in New X-Men, and it didn't. Morrison picked up the thread that you had already established in Generation X, similarly with Cyclops, following the events of the 12 and him now I can frame it a bit better does not have that sense of self. He almost lost himself to apocalypse. He's going to want to reconnect with Corsair. And this is something that this moment is something that is the beginning of the character's journey for a couple of decades. He does reunite with Corsair in space and he gets to have that time with him, but it, it's teen cyclops it's the o5 cyclops uh, pulled pull from uh -huh. the past and body so not technically the same but technically the, our cyclops would have the memories of teen cyclops so you know in a complicated way did they but david i thought this was a great issue this is 
a, an issue I read by myself here in Miami, and I felt like no one else read it. So I'm so glad this is like your ultimate favorite issue. Yep, right up there. It's it's number one. It stands none. What did you like most about it? I love the whole thing about like it being about perspective, you know, because like it's all like neither of them understand each other. But then once they 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 get to see the perspective of the other, then all of a sudden things start clicking for them. And then that that's when they're ready to put things aside and start having that conversation. So um, I think that definitely the moment with the heat beams is the one that hit it for me, though, like that, that well, right I mean, there, like, you know, the page that you sent me where. It's like, oh, yeah, sorry I'm late. The traffic in the, you know, Barbula or Nebula was terrible. And then he's like, so are we supposed to hug or what? And he's like, well, only if you want to. And he's like, you yeah, know, so both of them probably did want to hug in that moment. But the yeah, yeah. between them over the years has been such that, you know, neither one, neither the leader of the X-Men or the leader of the Star Jammers had it in them to reach out in that moment and it's like oh so sad you know yeah and it's that macho bullshit that we you know that the, that front that we put up just because we're trying to like you know we're trying to we're trying to you know what's the, what's the word um be stoic natural weakness basically you know yeah and, and 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 it's funny because it's like it's 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 macho bullshit about trying not to show weakness but this whole it, like this whole comic is about like like finding that weakness and finding the, that ability to, to like, you know, put that, put that facade down, you know, cause you're missing out on, on that hug with your dad that, you know, it's, it's just a beautiful issue. Uh, great job. Well, you know, what's interesting about that. When I was a kid, I had asthma really, really bad. So I spent the first, I don't know, 13 years of my life in a, in a room. Um, but I, but my brothers and my dad were all super, super, super sports freaks, and they just love sports, 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 Giants, New York Giants, got to win. And I never, ever got it. And I realized as I got older that my dad really didn't get, you know, me in the drama club and the writing and the comics. He's like, oh, okay, you know, I wish you'd go out and toss the football around a little. Um, but because of that, like, I think that. When I got older, I was the first member of my family that started to see my father as a friend and not just a father, you know. And I think all of us come to this point where, you know, like you love your dad or you're afraid of your dad or you're, you know, whatever your feelings are about your dad. But there comes a point where like, okay, I'm an adult now and, you know, I, I don't need that from him anymore i don't need his acceptance i don't need you know his money to buy food i don't need all the so suddenly your relationship changes and you have the ability to be equal and i for me i was the first person in the family i was like oh wait a minute we don't have to worry about like sports or car or da, 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 da. oh here we are okay this is fun i remember uh driving around i had a cassette tape of uh al jolson's favorite hits, which even at uh, my age was ridiculously, you know, 30 years off the beaten path. Like, you know, a 20 year old should not be listening to Al Jolson on a video. <laughs> and I remember driving around with my dad and he's like, oh, I love this, I love this. So here we are like singing Al, you know, Al Jolson songs together. I'm like, oh wow, this is like, you know, like this would be if you were with your friends and you're singing, you know, meatloaf or something so so that is you know I mean, so i think everybody at some point if you're lucky if your dad lives long enough that you get to that point where not, not to say there weren't times when he was definitely my father and i you know needed a hug or i needed advice or whatever but there, there comes a point where you are friends and i think that for scott and corsier who were the idea is, is that because they're so, uh, because they're because of the distance. Talk about a, a, a father. I mean, talk about distance. Uh, your feel, father feeling distant by a few uh, light years. Um, <laughs> that's what I think was that issue. That issue was about you know we're not going to solve everything. 
we're just gonna, you know, get through this night without one of us being like, oh, gotta go, X Men calling me, oh, gotta go, Star Jammers, you know. And uh, so I think that was. But thank you for liking that one. This is really one of my favorites as well. So I know there's a question in there, something about his costume. I don't remember anything about uh, his costume or being any different from. You know, I think it's Sal, Sal Roca, just uh, hugely underrated. People always ask me about, you know, Joe Matt and Chris Pacella and J.R. Jr., but Sal really, Carlos Pacheco, Sal really, really turned in some gorgeous stuff, so. I, absolutely gorgeous and he would go on to do extreme x-men in just a few years from this from this issue and absolutely stunning work one of yeah, our favorites you, you know it's funny because uh i remember around the uh uh wedding around there uh jim uh jim from up in uh, marketing at marvel came downstairs and he goes, uh, Lovedo hasn't thrown a punch in four issues in uh, X-Men. They're all talking, they're going to the bar, they don't know, nobody's using their powers, no, nothing. And Bob is like, uh, oh, you know, what, what we can fix that. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do some action stuff. He goes, no. He's like, I kind of like it. It's kind of cool, you know. And so, you know, I would often leave Fabian to like plop, 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 plop. And then I'd be like, well, if he's doing all the plotting, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do the uh, issue where uh, the Thanksgiving issue where they play football and, you know, Xavier gets his nose broken. I'm like, okay, you do all the plotting you want. I'm going to go over here and do, you know. Okay, but that Thanksgiving issue is incredible where Gene proposes to Cyclops. And then the, the, punch in that issue is the very end where gene is like we have something to announce and jubilee's like oh did you finally pick a code name it was <laughs> hysterical you you know it's funny though because all those issues the ones that that they would there weren't any punches thrown at well, any real punches thrown um those are practically my entire list you know of best scott moments because i think you really excelled when it came to those moments you know character moments you you made those characters who they are and it, and even it, like it, and you you delved into their personalities and 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 what connections like if if you see my list it's cyclops and corsair and then it's someone and someone else it's moments between two characters that really affected me in each one of these and and that so um the only big pow punching moment that i that that i have on my list is wolverine stabbing magneto but even that it, it's a, it's a big character moment and i i'd like to get into that one too next because it uh you know it also builds off the whole cyclops and wolverine and and their you know cyclops is hot off the heels of like um this is immediately after I think um the search uh, for Cyclops. Right, the search for Cyclops. So, you know, he he's you know, he's trying to find himself. He's he's having these weird feelings and and, and Wolverine and Cyclops are, are are trying to like uh they're they're having like a weird bromance, you know? And um it, <laughs> not as that, weird as Kirk Cohen. The Kirk Cohen bromance they had. Yeah, no, that's a different kind of <laughs> bromance. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but but yeah, so so yeah, the, Eve of Destruction. Yeah, the Eve of Destruction, and and that issue is uh, X Men one thirteen, oh, yeah, which yeah. is right yeah. before Grant Morrison. So you, you you had Wolverine come in and stab Magneto finally after all these years. Why? You know, well, a few things. It's interesting that you point out like the the Cyclops and uh, uh, Wolverine is. You know, I don't know. There's, there are things about the X Men universe, and I've said this before, like when I was talking last time about uh, uh, Mister Sinister, is like there are just things that I do not get about the X Men universe, and one of the things I never got was this, was the triangle between Scott and Jean and and Wolverine. I think it was 
1000% in Wolverine's head, you know, which is weird yeah. to have a triangle Agreed. based on one person, you know, like going, oh, this couple over there, you know, they seem very in love and I really love her. So we're in a triangle. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, she probably doesn't even know you're alive, to be honest. Um, and so the idea of putting uh, Cyclops, well, another example is uh, uh, Storm and Forge. Yes, they had this uh, life death story that took place over, I don't know, a decade, 15 or whatever it was. It was a long time. Like Chris and Barry would get it in them to write another section of it. And then, you know, I mean, so, so there was there, there was that love affair. But by the weekend that I got on the X-Men, I went back and read the last, you know, five, six years before that. And I'm thinking, wow, they're supposed to be in love, but they're never on camera together. Like, I don't get what this relationship is. And so I was like, well, you know, there's already so many X-Men. Let's just get rid of him and let's get rid of him within the context of what are we doing? You know, we're we're sort of in love, but you're off on the moon and you don't check in. And we're just like, what is going on? What are we? And um, and so same thing with Cyclops and uh, Wolverine. I understood in the beginning that, you know, Wolverine didn't like to be told what to do and Cyclops' job was to tell him what to do. So there would be that tension. But over the years, I was going, I don't understand why they're not, you know, I mean, they're the the two physically coolest X-Men. If they were going to be on a mission together, that should be like, you know, that should be like the coolest issue ever. So. And it was. Yeah. And so that's why, so, so that's why I would, um, you know, and then also we'll we'll talk about uh, we'll we'll talk about when we get to it. But um, with the in the absence of Storm, I do think that Wolverine would have been Cyclops's pick. So so to see the two of them, you know, as Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, was like really fun. So and, and you know, it's funny. It's it's weird because if you look at uh, Eve of Destruction. There's Eva Destruction and then there was the other one, uh, Zero Tolerance at the same time. Um, I, you know, I was like, I never understood Genosha. I thought it was the most absurd idea, no offense to Chris, but the idea of an island full of mutants who were slaves was like, what are these mutant powers like? Sir, I will bring you your orange juice every day. I squeezed it myself, you know, with my powerful elbow. Oh, well, like how we have these mutants, mutant slaves with these power. I was like, what do you do? So I never, ever, ever got it. And so I said to Marvel, like, you know, you, I was like, there's just too many X-Men. If I'm going to come and do this arc, why don't you let me just get rid of Genosha, you know, I mean, I'd gotten rid of most of the Morlocks a few years ago, a few years before that. And they were like, yeah, okay, you know, if you want to get rid of Genosha, that's fine, no one's going to care. And so the whole story was about Magneto taking his place, you know, first in charge of Genosha, and then them dethroning him and, you know, liberating the Genosians or whatever it was. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a good storyline. And they had been pushing Grant's and Joe Casey's arrival on the books for a long time. So I left both stories in place so that if they needed another four months, I would just keep going from that four months. Um, As it is, they didn't. But then the next issue comes out, I'm reading it, and what happens? Genosha is assaulted, and everybody dies. And you're like, I'm thinking to myself, like, (laughs) Did they read? Like, did, did they know? I mean, they knew. They knew those issues were being done as I was doing my issues. So I always thought it was really weird. It was like, you know, because really, if you hold the two of them next to each other, they're, you know, they're like bookends, but the same story. It's very weird. So. Well, it, it, I always saw yours as as like the, the ending of an era, basically. Like, and, and it, it was like your era. It, it's basically like, uh, Scott uh, Scott's 
X Men's The End. You know, like you know how they, they um they did like the end story. Chris did his his the end story. I thought this was your the end story, which it ends with Cyclops, Jean, Xavier having a beer. And, oh, and Wolverine having a beer, and that was it. You know, and it was it was it, it, it's the perfect way to end your era. I thought. I I thought like like it if, really is you, you had them face well, off no, Magneto. No, it, yeah, it probably would have resonated a little more if. Genosha wasn't destroyed the next issue. So. <laughs> <laughs> by, was, by, Wolverine, by, by Magneto, who seemed to really bounce back from that being yeah, stabbed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> being dead and impaled. Scott, how, how was it like switching hands during this year? I don't think we tackled that last last time. Were there Was it bittersweet sort of passing the buck off to Morrison and Casey? Uh, no, I mean, it was, you know, I had, I had left. Uh, I had mentally left before that anyway and i was actually remember i was gone uh with S steve seagal and oh you're right Joe absolutely and yeah there was that whole error so it was sort of just like a, a like a little touchstone you know like i was like uh, oh, there are some right. things that i would like to do and one of those things i felt that uh uh ending the legacy virus because I thought there were a lot of good stories that came from legacy virus, but as a metaphor for AIDS, it just kind of, you know, dissolved. And so I thought, you know what, if I'm going to leave, I should really like, well, before I go. You know? That's, that's one of the other ones on our list, which is Colossus yeah. sacrificing himself in uncanny X-Men 390, where, you know, he says, Snowflake, I'm coming home because Ileana, which also is another moment on our list, which is Ileana dying from the legacy virus. So uh, spoiler you, alert. That is actually really, can you walk us through that process from Ileana contracting the legacy virus? Was that your idea all the way through Colossus making that sacrifice since both moments are on the list? Yeah, I, you know, I... You know, we start when characters start dying of the legacy virus, they were all kind of like nobody characters, you know. And, and I was like, we can't just have you know pyro coughing and dropping over. It's like it just what didn't feel like there are any stakes. And you know, so I was like, what could be more heartbreaking than you know a completely innocent person dying? from the disease. And then I thought really like this is uh, going to send Colossus to like a really dark place because of it. So it wasn't like, oh, I want a headline that says this is the issue that you must read this month. It was like, like which I had nothing to do with that, that crazy cover copy. But, um, but I did think, okay, I realized that I was really uh taking a dagger to a bunch of new mutant fans who really loved Ileana, but she hadn't been Ileana. She hadn't been magic in so long that I'm like, okay. Um, but I, uh, you know, when I left, I hadn't thought about the legacy virus, but then afterwards, as the years went by, I was like, you know, let me do something. And when I turned it in, it was such a heartbreaking issue and the editor like was like oh my god this was the saddest issue ever. and if you remember the next issue was uh uh kitty pride taking peter's ashes and dropping them over the orst ordonsky yeah uh, thing and i thought okay i've done it i've i've done it I've figured out how to kill off a character and there's no way on god's earth that this character is going <laughs> You know, like I thought, okay, Uncle Ben, you know, uh, Gwen before she became Gwenpool, but here was a death that was gonna stay. Yeah. And you know, and then Josh Whedon showed up and he's like, Oh, they switched bodies. I'm like, oh, they switched bodies. Okay, that's fine. Um, and it was weird too, because I'm sorry, I mean you guys can correct me because I haven't read it. I just I did read the first few issues of Joss just to see. But I didn't see, I never saw anything that justified bringing Colossus back, you know, like it was just. I it, yeah, I, I think, and, and David, I'm sorry to cut you off. I think it was because, it's, to my understanding, his favorite character was Kitty Pride, 
uh, on the back end, and he modeled a lot of Buffy off of 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 Kitty, and he really wanted to give sto- a, a story to Kitty. So what was one thing to do was bring Colossus back, and then tied into the old world, and he was prophesized to destroy that planet, and it was sort of their big over overarching arc. I, I I felt his his res- resurrection was a little premature. It, it was a great moment when Kitty sees Colossus for the first time. Beautiful moment. Beautiful. It was uh, yeah. uh, the John Cassidy there, art where she grabs her heart and like he yeah, walks yeah. through her. It was really pretty. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. But other than that, that was like you know like, I don't think their relationship like elevated or deteriorated or it's just kind of like oh we're back together, Katya. You know, and then, and then that was it, you know, and then I don't know, like, maybe he has been uh, around, I mean, maybe, I mean, how, how many years ago is that, 15 years ago or something? Yeah, so, you know, so but, actually I, was like 2005. Yeah, so I don't see, I, I don't, can't recall any, like, big. No, moment. that's fair. That's, I agree with you. You know, Scott, you, you framed it for me perfectly not only in just private conversations, but when we've had it on the podcast, it's one, making sure that readers feel that they're taking something away from the story, that these aren't just boring situations that go on for pages. And two, if you make them cry, you have them forever. And that is why we're still here talking about Kitty spreading Colossus's ashes. That's why we're here still talking about Ileana dying from the legacy virus, because in those stories, you had us forever. We were... It was. I think heartbreak is the best way to sum it up. When I was first reading, you know, Ileana dying, and it was at three hundred three on Kenny X Men three hundred three. I should look at my notes here. I'm horrible with. Yes, it was. Yeah, 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 was three hundred three. Yes, three hundred three. Yeah. And it wasn't even just. It's not even just the act of the character dying, but the execution of it. You had Kitty Pride returning, and not only was she returning to the mansion, she was meeting up with Jubilee, who is you know the new X Men ingenue, and. There was just a lot happening there. What was it like writing that scene with with Kitty and Jubilee? Well, you know, it's funny because Jubilee was really... uh, I only looked at Jubilee as a fan until I had to write her, and I just didn't quite understand. Like, it just... She literally felt like a a stand-in for another character, and and that was it. I mean, I, I really didn't get any... You know, I didn't understand why... Wolverine had her around other than that she was his sidekick. I didn't understand why she was there. She wasn't, you know, even in the comic book, I mean, even in the animated, it seemed they made her like on the run for her life. And you go, okay, well, I guess that's why she's there. But it was funny because, you know, I think last time we talked about Lockjaw, about like the Lockjaw story that, you know, people would read and go, oh my God, that Lockjaw story. I love that Lockjaw story. And I would just be like, well, because you haven't read any of the lockdown stories. And I really found once I delve into uh, Jubilee that there was so much, so much potential in that character. And part of that potential was not making her uh, giddy pride. And so when the two of them, I mean, it's funny because that piece of artwork that you sent me where they meet, Kitty pride looks like she's played by Catherine Hepburn in uh, On Golden Bond. I mean, she looks oh, great. You know, I, I say Elizabeth Shue because of Adventures in Babysitting, but yes, that is that that is 100% the comp, though. It's Catherine Hepburn. Yeah, and so you, you compare that to, you know, uh, where Kitty was when she first showed up, and then it's all of a sudden it's like, okay, so how does Jubilee fit in this world? And instead of treating her just like, oh, she's like a regular X-Men and, you know, look, we're going to go fight Apocalypse. You get on your rollerblades and throw some sparkles at him. It's like, what? <laughs> Is that really your master plan? <laughs> like, it sounds like a terrible idea. Um, but so instead of ta- taking her and being like, oh, she's an X-Men, it's more like, no, she was in the X-Men world. So how does she react? And, you know, like she, you know, I mean, to dump her almost right away into this scenario where she's one of the last people to be with Ileana and then her brother is going to show up and it's like, you know, and she turns and she's like, you know, he didn't, he didn't cry. He didn't punch a wall. He just left. You know, it's like, you know, that was a perspective that none of the other X-Men could have had because they all knew him 
forever. And so it was really fun to take Jubilee and throw her into the middle of this, you know. And also the fact that she, you know, it would be her inclination to not like Kitty because like people always, you know, she was the previous, she's the new Kitty. So to suddenly meet Kitty and wanting to like hate her and then all of a sudden, you know, Ileana likes her and, you know, Kitty's reading to her in her Russian, her native Russia, you know, like <laughs> Jubilee's like, what am I doing? I mean, like it was just so, it was just really fun to, you know, because it, it's it's interesting because I, uh, X-Men conference and uh, they were sitting around and they said, well, what do you think about the X-Men? Like, what's the X-Men? And everybody's like, oh, they're family. It's a family. They're family. That's why we like, I mean, they're family. They're family. And I'm thinking to myself like, who likes family? Like, you know, like you try to get, you grow up, you get away from your family. That's how that works. You know, like it, now, I mean, I love my family to death, but I'm thinking if you're an average fan and you're picking up a comic book, you don't necessarily want to see family, 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 family. family. And then they went around the room and they go, well, you know, Kurt's like the fun uncle, you know, and Wolverine's like the mean uncle. And I'm going, oh my God, this sounds so unappealing, you know, like, <laughs> you know, and I mean, I always loved the X-Men when they could rub up against each other, you know? So, like, instead of answering the door and be like, and then there was Kitty Pride, and I, it was the most amazing moment in my life. And so it's like, oh, great, what's she doing here? You know, it's like, it's like let, you know, let people act like they would act as people and not necessarily how they would act, you know, because this is the 350th version of, you know, another story by the X-Men, you know? So, um, but no, I really loved that. I really loved that issue. And uh, I love that she took the uh, Banff doll and she put it on the bed and, you know. I mean, I wept like a baby when I read this as a kid, David. <laughs> I know. And, and, and you, you just like, you did so many amazing things with Jubilee. You made her my, one of my favorite characters. I, I when I watched the animated series, I was like, eh, you know, whatever. But when I actually went into like reading the comics, because, you know, I, I first I, I came in with the animated series and then I, I started reading the comics. Um, wow. I, I mean, the, the story of, of Jubilee and Xavier and, you know, like he, he, he's just trying to like he's walking for the first time and it might be the last time he ever walks in a while. And, and, and I mean, that story yeah, right that there. Yeah. And she decides the way to get, let him have the most of it is by dunking him into the, uh, you know, like they're rollerblading. And then suddenly she dunks him into the lake. It was like, yeah. what a joke. Yeah. yeah it, that... it's, it's, it's beautiful though. It's a, <laughs> you know, but it's that, human. That, that's another one on the list, which is Uncanny X-Men 297, the Professor and Jubilee moment. And Scott, what was your what was the thought process behind that? Well, Why you know, it's funny. We were just talking a few minutes ago about like uh, like Sal Roca's uh, thing. Is I know so many people, so many artists get on the X Men and they're like, "This is my chance to show off, and I'm going to have like Wolverine and Sabretooth fighting, and they're going to be the most amazing thing." And then they get this script, and it's like you know, Professor X and Brandon Peterson, like his. I don't know, third issue on the X-Men, maybe even his first. And he's like <clears throat> ready to take the world by storm. And suddenly he has to write an issue where, you know, Beast and uh, Angel are putting together their old coffee shop. And, you know, Professor X is, can finally walk and Jubilee decides, oh, I'm going to throw him in the lake. That'll be a riot. You know, like, <laughs> so, and I'm sure he was like, oh, okay, well, I'm doing my best. But it was a beautiful issue, and it like really stretched him more than I think. Because if I remember correctly, he'd done a wetworks, cyberworks, whatever it's called, first, and you know that was all every And same thing with Richard Bennett. I mean, Richard Bennett, as near as I know, only wrote one one comic book that I know of. He was an inker, and he really wanted a shot to uh, draw. And the issue that I got to draw was the issue where Ileana died. And it's like, you know, it was it was heartbreaking because of what happened, but it was also heartbreaking because of his artwork. It was so, you know, yeah, so beautiful. And, you know, um, that last page where 
Jubilee is crying in uh, Jean's arms. Oh my God. You know, but like, yeah, they even sure that he, out. It is, it is a powerful image. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm sure that he was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, but there's a bunch of uh, artists who like, I'm sure didn't particularly, like Sal, I'm sure, I'm sure Sal, Sal really wanted to show off. And then suddenly he gets a camping trip between, you know, so, and he's probably waiting as he's <laughs> probably reading the script, turning the page, he's waiting Imperial Guard to come in and try to kill them. You know, it's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta be able to draw something. You know, instead they, uh, you know. So, but I do think that those are the issues that linger some 25, 30 years later, you know. So, uh, and I do That's find funny. it, I don't, you know, I don't read, I don't read comics, but I do glance. And once in a while I'll see like, uh, when James Tinian did uh, Detective Comics, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was such a '90s comic, and it felt very '90s Lobdell, if I may be so bold. And and I just wonder why more people don't steal that formula, you know? Because I just don't see. I mean, like you know, I would think that if I came across an old, uh, we used to call them rooftop issues. Uh, if I came across an old, if I came across a rooftop issue now when I was in a comic book store, I'd be like, holy shit. What is going on? But instead, it's like, you know, I don't, when I glance, I don't see those moments anymore. But I don't know, maybe I'm just missing something. But I, I no, love no, that era of detective comics. That's the one with Spoiler and Tim yeah, Drake yeah. And, and Clayface. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, yeah. my God. I'm sorry to cut you off, David. But I, I read that. I'm not a big detective comics fan but i picked up those issues and we love them so much and so i agree with you it's very love dell-esque yeah if you look at it exactly i mean he was like doing this master class on you know on me and i just was like wow he's really doing i mean no wonder people love him because he you know knows how to make you feel while he's telling a story so and there's so many writers that don't do that and i just you know i don't know why i don't know why editors don't demand an issue of you know, at least once a year, just one, one a year would be good. You know, like why wouldn't an editor say, I want you to rip up my guts, this issue, you know, I want to feel, something, I feel terrible. I want to feel sad. I want to feel touched, you know, but I don't see it. it it's sad. Cause it, it, it's true. Cause right now all comics are basically bam 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 you know next fight and the, the, here's a new or, i'm sorry it's always the old villain because they don't even make new villains anymore that's that's the thing like it's like the same rehash stories over and over and over again there's there's no and i i hate to sound like you know the the, the old man yelling at the sky but it's it's really gotten to the point where character driven stories are no longer in comic books it's all about the wham bam thank you ma'am you know but yeah, and maybe some editor maybe some marketing people are like no that's what people want they just want blah, 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 you know like you know i mean i'm not i, I shouldn't say this because i don't want to be rude and again this i'm speaking 100 percent from ignorance but i don't know how long the krakoa story lasted but it seemed to last a long time yeah and the fact that it was always the Krakoa story it's like you know why wasn't it the you know like even the when you see uh x-men animation when uh gambit dies oh my god what a moment holy shit was that a moment you know yeah and, but i don't know like i don't uh you know it was almost like doing the opposite it was like instead of having these tearful goodbye to these characters you just have you know them showing up oh i'm alive now oh he's alive they're alive he's alive he's alive everybody's there oh we can raise everybody from the dead. oh you're alive you're alive it's like that seems exactly to be and those are all moments like if they if you were writing them they would be character moments where it's like such a big deal that they're there i remember one uh, it, it, they uh they mentioned changeling Right. And it's Xavier. And then he goes, oh, poor changeling. I swear to God, that's the that is what Xavier says about that. The first X-Men to die on the field of, you know, in, in, well, in, in, in Xavier's life to boot, you know, like, like covering for Xavier to boot. It's like, 
you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, it, it, he died for the most just cause and, and, oh, poor changeling. That's all you gotta say, you know? Like, I don't know. It, it was, well, it that's, was like with, um, that's like with uh, Morph over in uh, whatever we were seeing now, going through the uh, characters for Age of Apocalypse. They said, who do you want? I go, I want Morph. And they're like, uh -huh. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I want Changeling. And they're like, who's Changeling? And I said, the guy who gave up his life for Xavier. I mean, if Xavier died, then Changeling never would have had to pretend to be Xavier, and he never would have died. So, like, in a way, he's like the first biggest impact of Xavier's life. And then they were like, well, okay, but he just has that, you know, uh, that Paul hair. And, you know, how is that going to be interesting? And I was like, well, because he's been shape shifting for so long, he's completely lost any sense of identity. So he looks like a number two eraser. Like that's his standard face. He's just lost it, you know? Oh, I love and, that. Like, I love that that perspective for Morph, by the way. And by the way, Bo the Mayo carried it through for X Men 97. Well, that's what made me laugh. Yeah. Well, that's for for that reason. For that yeah. reason. Sorry. Yeah. And that's what made me laugh because I was like, I'm going to fall. In fact, I'm not going to call him change. I'm going to call him Morph yeah. after the show, which was just this kind of like funny. It wasn't really a date, but it was made me laugh. And and then when I see the new one, I mean, like you know, even now they just boy, they are. I saw a uh, somebody said to me, "Oh Scott, they mentioned you in a podcast. You got to see this. It's so exciting. They mentioned you in a podcast for X Men Animated." And I said, "Oh okay." So he sends me the podcast, and it's. It's Larry and it's two other people and it's the host. And the host goes, oh, and then you did a lot of, uh, a lot of Scott Bell stuff, right? And they're like, and the host is like, yeah, I love, I love that guy. And they're like, I'm thinking to myself, man, you guys do not. It is so hard for you to give credit where <laughs> you do. I mean, like literally it was as if he just let out a huge fart in the middle of a podcast and it was just all like, <laughs> you know, but but it's so funny because I'm sorry there is no X Men '97 morph without Age of Apocalypse morph. It just agree. You know, yeah, I agree. agree. And, and honestly, like you brought that character back. Like Changeling was such a like who nobody thought of Changeling back in the day, you know. And then like you, if it wasn't for you, he probably wouldn't have been in the animated series either, you know. In general, the, the the original animated series. Not I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. I don't even think. I, I don't even think that was the same. Oh no! Yeah. So I think the morph they they wanted it to be changeling, um, and then they they killed him off because they wanted a character that they could just kill off. It was originally supposed to be Thunderbird, and then they went to changeling, and then the character because so many people you know kids this was what 92 so many kids really wrote in saying morph was one of their favorite characters they brought him back for season two but the character had his official resurgence because of scott and because of age of apocalypse because that's when sure. the character became really popular to the point that they were and this is scott's story to tell not mine but i think they eventually wanted to bring him him blink and nate over to the main universe and then he eventually went to exiles and everyone was just crazy about the character and the morph we have today that we see in 97 is again to echo what scott said it's because of the work he did during age of apocalypse which is fine i mean i tried to i, I think i tried to give people credit when i was doing things i certainly i mean it was easier for me because i only had chris that i had to give credit to at the time <laughs> um but it just makes I, I i do i have to say i find it kind of funny it's like oh. well you know you, you you're giving a lot of credit you know, you you like to give credit where you where you do, but you also kicked off Generation X, and that oh my goodness, talk about a shift in in just like comic books and and for readers like me and David, that is yeah, right there that Chrome cover uh, right oh. there. Look at that. Look at well, that. you know, it's so interesting to me because I loved uh, Generation X, and when Chris and I were first creating the characters. He was like, who's our Colossus? I go, we don't have a Colossus. He goes, well, who's our, you know, Wolverine? I go, there's no Wolverine. It's like, every time you look at an image book, it looked like a knockoff of the X-Men. And I was like, let's 
make the new thing that people knock off. That'll be a, that'll be our, our imprint. We're going to be, you know, in five years, everybody's going to be doing Generation X versions. And I don't think there was ever a single, maybe the closest you could come is Umbrella Academy, maybe. Yeah, that's but, fair. But other than that, like, have you ever seen, I mean, there's no, you can't hold up a comic book and go, oh, look, this looks like, and even when they would do Generation X, it would look like uh, New Mutants. You know, as yeah. I don't know the difference between me and I, but it just never like even you know, I mean I think in uh, when we did New Fifty Two, the problem between Marvel and DC, and in, in so many ways, some one of the problems is that we used to call them the the silhouette problem in the sense that you know you look at the X Men. And even the Fantastic Four, the silhouettes, the one guy's stretching and the one guy's flaming in the air and the other guy looks like he's built of uh, like a little mountain. And, uh, and then you look at the uh, Justice League of America, it's like, oh, there's a guy standing and behind him is a girl standing and on the other side is a guy standing. And look, behind them, there's a guy standing and on the other side, there's a guy standing and over here, there are guys standing. You know, it was like the silhouette problem. There's nothing... It was just a bunch of humans. And when I uh, did Teen Titans for the New 52, I was uh, assigned uh, the three of them, uh, no, I'm sorry, the four of them, uh, Kid Flash, Wonder Woman, uh, Superboy, and uh, Red Robin. And I threw the wings on Red Robin. So at least if it, again, if it was a silhouette, you go, okay, that's something different. Like what am I looking at? Um, but then the other three characters all had issues. And when we created Generation X, it was like, I, like we got to move away from the Ken and Barbie of mutants. We got it like, you know, if these guys are mutants, they're settled, settled with being mutants, you know, or skin has more skin than he needs. And, you know, uh, Penance is, uh, you know, impossible to touch because it'd be like, you know, hugging a diamond or something. Um, Chamber blew out his chest cavity the first time and then Hus cast to literally rip her skin off of her body to trigger her superpower. <laughs> Creepy. Um, and then M was just perfect because that's who she is. Um, but when you... Uh, Compare that to, like, I, I just, you just don't see. I agree. The, you don't see a knockoff of Generation X. You don't you see don't anybody see. taking the lessons of Generation X and applying them to anything. And literally, it's like 30 years ago this year. You know? Yeah. We, I, I mean, I, listen, Generation X, that comic book just blew us all out of the water the art the the bold strokes you took in the storytelling even tying it in with age of apocalypse the seeds you planted during age age of apocalypse with the characters i just think it was it was a good example that you never spoke down to your readership you knew who your readership was they loved all this context clues they could follow along with you and you created interesting characters that we hadn't seen before and there were familiar faces with emma and banshee and jubilee and, and they were I, all natural yeah, like natural progressions for those characters, you know. And it was it was a leveling up, and there just there isn't anything like that anymore. You know, and I don't want to be shady because I have enjoyed some of the stories coming from from the ashes, which is the the current X Men relaunch. But they're trying to throw in new characters there, and you're like, oh, I just don't care. But when you know we got Generation X one, we suddenly cared all about these characters, about Chamber, about Skin, and Mondo, and even Cordelia Frost. You know, and it, it, it's a testament to the groundwork that you and Chris did for that series. You know, what's interesting is that uh, you know I've worked with Bob Harris for since since I started with the X Men, um, and then I worked with him over at DC. You know, Bob always uh, has almost always has an opinion about something. And he and I, nine times out of 10, share that opinion. Um, I think it was 325 where uh, Storm killed Marrow. Yeah, yeah. 
And he said, 325 should be big. You should have Storm kill Meryl the same way that she almost killed uh, Callisto. And I did not want to do it. And I didn't understand it. And I thought, you can't tell me that like after 150 issues, that's the message that Storm got is sometimes it's okay to kill somebody. Like, I, you know, and it was really hard. And I rewrote it from scratch four times until I was comfortable enough with the story and with that moment having to happen. And then I was able to do it. But so it's not like we always thought the same way, but we would often think the same way. And when he knows characters, he knows what he wants out of them. And so he is very hands-on. You know, in you know, and and it's and it's his job is to not just have writers come out and be like, I want to do, you know, have them learn polka. You know, they don't want to learn polka. So, you know, like, uh, but if he doesn't know the characters and he doesn't understand it, then he just sits back and watches, and that's why tonally there's such a difference between Age of Apocalypse and. Uh, all my X-Men work is because Bob was like, this is fascinating. These are really interesting characters, you know? And I think I told you the only note that he ever gave me was that I had to kick Emma off because she kicked Leech. Oh yeah. 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 And that was the only yeah. note. And I was like, no. And, uh, yeah, absolutely not. Which is a great moment. Yeah. And so that is, uh, you know, that was, uh, that's why they're so different is because, you know, and, you know, even things like, I'll be honest, I don't, I'd have to, I don't even have the script anymore, I wouldn't know. I'd have to ask Chris, and I don't know if he would know. But, like, the, them playing, uh, you know, like, I, I knew that Paige got drunk because she couldn't deal with the fact that, you know, wait a minute, my whole life I planned to be an X-Men and now I can die from the legacy virus for no other reason than I'm a mutant. Like how, that's like totally unfair. And, you know, the fact that she was drunk and, you know, rolling around on the uh, pool table, like I don't think I could ever have asked that. But when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that is so powerful, you know. Or when her and Skin were playing uh, uh, Scrabble, you know, like I may have said, oh, you're they're playing a board game or they're, you know, sitting at the table or whatever. But then Chris came up with a game and then there was those tiles. And I'm like, oh, I can play it like I can like tell another story with this subtext with these tiles. I mean, it's like, you know, it was just it was magic. It was a magical run. You know? Definitely. I, I feel like Chris had he he always added like little little um details to everything uh, like I, it's funny cuz like when you see his his like like generation x1 uh, toward and then like you see his evolution later to like his later drawing style like it, generation x1 uh, one is like it's a really perfectly drawn comic great comic i i love it it's beautiful but it is more cookie cutter in the sense of the way it's drawn stylistically. But then little by little, uh, Generation X had its own style, you know, mm -hmm. at least up until the uh, 20, issue 25, which is, I think, the last one with you and Chris working on it. And it, you, I, I don't know, just they like, I, I just, I loved Chris's like really expressive and, and, almost animated look to all the characters, you know? Well, it's funny because I know that I'm sure, it, and he would tell you probably the same thing, that he didn't trust me in the beginning, not that he didn't trust me, like that I was untrustworthy, but he didn't trust me because I told him that whatever he turned in, I would write it. And so he was still like, in the beginning being like, well, I, I can't draw like Jim Lee. And I was like, there's so many Jim Lee artists out there. If I wanted them, I could call all 30 of them and, and say, come do Generation X and make it look like a Jim Lee drawing. Um, and so I think it was like by, you know, even by like the third issue when he started uh, with the bubbles on the plane. I mean, he was just. Those design you know, flourishes were beautiful. 
Yeah, no. like when he realized that I was not going to rein him in, he would just went farther and farther afield. And it was almost like he was trying to stump me, like, oh, I'm going to throw in these uh, goblins on the Halloween issue. And I'm like, oh, how about it? Okay, let's see what we can do. You know, so each issue felt like its own thing, which was great. Scott, you are, thank you again for coming back on Power. Yeah, hold on. Oh, no problem. It was a blast. It was a blast. We have so many more questions that we will take up next time. But, Familia, hit Scott Labdell up Curious, on Instagram. Yeah, What's Scott Labdell 2.0. All right, Scott. Sensei. And I promise I will shave. <laughs> All right, see you guys. All right, well, Scott's gone. But before we end this episode... Dave, bro, David, this is your first time on Power of X Men. I'm so happy to finally have you on the podcast. You have been since I moved down to Miami. I felt very lost. I was like, ah, I don't know what I'm doing here. I and you are one of the first friends I have made here, and it's such an honor to have you, man. Thank you. And the pleasure is all mine. I, you know, I love you, man. You're like you're you're like the little bro I never had. Actually, I have a, a little brother, and he, he's a great guy. I'm kind of mad at him, and it's his birthday in a couple days. <laughs> so happy birthday, bro. You're, uh, you're the older brother I never had. How about that? <laughs> All right, there you go. But yeah, uh, it, you know, it, it, we, we just have that that connection. And I, I feel like, like, like you're, 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 you know, um, yeah, that's just, I, lo I love you, bro. I love you, and we're doing book club here in Miami tomorrow at the Coconut Grove Library. This episode will come out after the fact, sadly, but I am excited to be doing that with you. Where can where can the familia hit you up at at, at on the social medias? Um, I mean, I have a bunch of Instagram names. I mean, which one do you want? You want to do uh, the Starman special or I am the Starman? Oh. Uh, you know, I'm I don't know the difference. I I just assumed you changed your name. <laughs> No, I just, I have so many, I, I like, I, I, you know, I have an identity crisis. Listen, look, welcome, welcome to being uh, in your midlife right there. Identity <laughs> crisis all the time. Um, Holy shit. I, now that you mentioned it, I never noticed it, but I'm 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same, same. I think we're the yeah. same age. I think we're more sibling, uh, more contemporaries than older brother, younger brother. But um, Starman special, the Starman special, is that it? Yeah, yeah. All right, Familia, hit us up at Power of X-Men, and we will see you guys later.